Hi, everybody. Um, I am Michael Hoffman. I am a person that grew up in the world of IT and cybersecurity and transitioned into OSINT from that. Right now, I have a whole bunch of hats that I wear within the open source intelligence community, field, and profession. Um, everything from owning the MyOSINT training platform that you're on right now, creating courses, teaching open source intelligence courses to people, either via recordings or in person. I also own the companion site along with one of my colleagues. I own uh, OSINT.games, which is hands-on experiential learning that helps you to put those things that you've already learned into practice. I also own a consulting company called Spotlight InfoSec, where I can teach courses, do OSINT for various customers, or do a lot of other types of things. Um, I also help to create the OSINT Curious Project nonprofit organization at osintcurio.us and uh, write blog posts, do live streams for them. In addition to all that, I also am a tool creator. I love taking some of the, the amazing OSINT opportunities that are out there and then putting them into, making them into tools so that people that, uh, people that uh, want to can use those uh, OSINT opportunities to find information about targets that they're searching. So I love making tools and I'll talk more about that. One of the tools I've made is called What's My Name? And uh, I have several other ones out there as well. And then in my consulting, I also work with the nonprofit organization, the National Child Protection Task Force, uh, helping to find missing, exploited, trafficked people around the world and to uh, really put some of the open source intelligence skills and tools that I've developed over the years and the ones that I'm still learning uh, into play to, for a very good cause to help find people. So people in my profession use open source intelligence in a lot of different ways. And it really depends on the hat that I'm wearing, uh, whether it's training people in open source intelligence skills, of course they're gonna use OSINT there. But I think some of the, the more interesting things are in the uh, OSINT researcher, um, looking for those places where uh, websites have some either privacy vulnerabilities or just there's hidden data in pages. I love kind of digging into the source code of pages or how web pages are connected and what data they're sending back and forth to discover some of those, those places that we can use in open source intelligence. So um, in I mean, since I'm really focused on all the things OSINT, when I have a customer that comes to me and says, I want you to find out uh, my online exposure. What are some weak points that I might want to uh, reduce or some exposure points that provide that, that present risk to me or my family or my company? Um, I use OSINT to do the queries, to research them, their companies and other things to give them a report and say, here's what I found and here's some of the recommendations. Um, but as far as other places, I mean, uh, some of the other things I do is create challenges so that people can learn open source intelligence by doing. Um, I also like trying out some of those challenges, looking at pictures, looking mm -hmm. at images, and, you know, ultimately testing and growing my skills as well. So I developed my OSINT skills uh, partly by just l reading and and uh, trying out things. I love trying out things and then trying to figure out how they work. Uh, so there are online tools out there for doing OSINT and have been for many years. I like looking at how those things work and uh, getting the, the resources that they're using so that I can figure out you know, how it all fits together. So there's been a lot of self-directed learning, just trial by error and using some of the cybersecurity, the IT, the database, the programming skills that I've developed over the years uh, in the work that I do. But I have done so, uh, a couple of training courses. Um, I, I tried to read a couple of the books about it. I love buying books, reading them and actually like 
following through uh, on them, I, I I seem to rarely do it. It's not that I get distracted. It's just that I get bored. I would rather have something that's interactive, something that is engaging and all like a, a live course or a video even with some hands-on skills somewhere where I can be doing and learning. So um, there, there are some uh, blog posts that I've read. And really, I, I think the biggest growth area for me and, and thing that opened my eyes was the hashtag OSINT on Twitter, where there are people that make tools discover OSINT, interesting things, publish blog posts, and they're all tagging their stuff with the hashtag of OSINT on Twitter. So it, I think if I had one place where I can attribute most of my learning and most of my growth, it would be the resources that are discussed over there. But I also like talking with like really talented people um, and, and learning from them. And I found that over the years that the more I work with other people, even remotely, the smarter I get and the more diverse my understanding of the world and the world of OSINT becomes. So um, a couple of stories. Uh, let me tell you a couple of stories about when like I've used OSINT or somebody in my fields used OSINT in their work. Um, the first is, is the tool making and researching, uh, which is one of my real passions. Uh, I love doing things in Python and I love just discovering how websites are put together. Um, so I can remember one of the first things that I did um, was I uh, went on a bicycle ride with one of my uh, one of my friends and uh, she and I rode our bikes around the neighborhood or whatever. And then afterwards she sent me an email and said, Hey, Micah, here's the, the route that we took. I, I had Strava running on my, on my um, mobile device while we were going and it recorded us. I'm like, wow, I've never heard of this. And I looked, it was my first introduction to really exercise based trackers. And it was back in 2014 or so. And I looked and I just clicked on the link she sent and I saw the, the ride and it had the exact locations where we rode, the elevation changes, the speeds we went. I was like, this is really cool. Oh, wait a second. I didn't have to authenticate to get to this. And I looked at the URL and it was just like number. Uh, it was like, you know, the, the name and strava.com slash activities and then slash one, two, three, four, five, six. And I was like, wow. If I can see this ride, I wonder if I could see other rides. And so I looked and sure enough, I could see other people's rides. And um, what I discovered then was that there were hundreds of millions of activities that were being stored on Strava without really being protected at all. And and I, I think, you know, that was more of like the cybersecurity. Hey, there's risk here. I let Strava know, hey, there's there's problem here. Um, and they said, hey, this is the way that our website's supposed to be. It's social. And I thought, well, okay, let me take my cyber hat off and put on my OSINT hat. What's the worst that somebody can do with this? And so I started analyzing those posts that were out there. And and it was really one of those times when, when I was really stuck struck with, with the power of analysis, you know, it, individually, I'm like, oh, look, this person went for a ride in Taiwan. This person went for a, a run over here in Azerbaijan. But um, in aggregation, you could see some really interesting things. And um, I won't spoil it. If you go to my website, webreacher.com slash videos, I have some, uh, there's some YouTube videos there. One of them is called Running Away from Security. And essentially, it's the um, disclosure of some of the weaknesses that I saw and also some of the interesting trends that I found, like a security company that was using Strava and made their security guards uh, log all of their patrols online, unprotected, uh, when uh, they would do their walk. So I could tell, hey, here's when the, the security guards were doing their walk and this is the name of the security guards, and this is where they walk. And when you aggregate that stuff, it showed places where a certain location that they were that they were patrolling was not being patrolled. They it showed me where they were doing it, but they sh it also showed me that they were that there was a whole section that was unprotected. So um, that was like real powerful, like 
aggregation. And, and that was one of my first real like OSINT type of things. Um, in cyber, I did uh, OSINT for reconnaissance phase of web hacking. And I tell the story a lot. One of the things that I, I found, it was again, one of those like momentous occasions in our process when we, before we actually started attacking a website, uh, we had it a, a little uh, process that we had to Google the name of the website if it was a, a site that was attached to the internet. So I took this website that we were going to attack and I Googled it and it came back with a PDF help file, you know, that the developers had created for the site. And like, if you want to use this app, here's how you do it. It's like, all right, well, you know, I found the document. Let's just look through it. So I started looking through it. And I saw that there was a, hey, if you want to log into the app, use a username like this. And if you want to use log in, here's a password like this. And it gave a clear text username and password. And I was like, well, could it be this easy to log into the app? Now I had permission to access the application. And I literally took that username and the password that I found from Googling a help document, went over to the application that I had permission to get into, logged in using those. And I was into the app and I told my, my, uh, web application penetration tester people. I'm like, Hey, I'm already in the app. They're like, how did you do that? I'm like, I Googled. And I knew that right then I, there was like this, like aha moment, like this is really powerful stuff. Um, lastly in, uh, the, the uh, anti-human trafficking, uh, child, anti-child exploitation, uh, work that I've been doing, um, I'm doing a lot more image analysis and some, a lot of that is, is very interesting to me because when you have a still image, you know, breaking down that image to its components parts and, and really like diving into that still frame of, of what you see can be really interesting if you're trying to figure out a geographic location or other stuff. And I remember one case I was working on where we had a picture of a canal in a certain part of the world. And, you know, I started using tools like Google Earth and aerial imagery and satellite imagery. And it was, the picture was from the past. So we had to actually use some of the historical imagery, which was, was kind of interesting. And, and then, you know, what ended up kind of breaking the case open was looking at the angle of the sun that, we could see in the image because the sun was at a certain point in the sky. We had the, it was one of those pictures, one of those cameras, I'm sorry, that, that took the date and put it into the, into the actual picture. And if you're from the, the past, like I am, those digital cameras used to embed the, the date and the date into the cam into the picture. So we had the date and we could see shadows created. And based upon that, I did some research on chronolocation and I determined that that sun, the, the place that the sun was in the sky would only be a certain region of the world on that date and time, because I had the date and time stamped into the picture, which was really helpful. And, you know, by just setting up those, we could not be north of this or south of this. Uh, we had another researcher that actually took that data and set up, oh, found the place. So. Um, that was really exciting uh, to be able to help solve those cases with that. Um, but there's so many other ways that I use open source intelligence, um, even in my personal life too. It's, uh, it's, it's been something that I really, really enjoy doing. So if somebody wants to pursue a career like mine, I'm not exactly sure which of my careers somebody would really want to like, um, pursue, but let's just take the OSINT researcher. Uh, I think one of the things I always say to people is get a diverse background and not just in the people you interact with, but also in the skills you acquire. I can't tell you the number of people that have come to me over the years and said, Hey, listen, I'm in this uh, career path, but I really want to get into open source intelligence. Is it going to be hard for me? And I'm like, no, you have all of this experience doing certain stuff that I don't know about. Bring that along with you. And that's very much the case. Um, you know, I come from a career, as I mentioned, of cybersecurity, IT, computers, technical things, Python programming. I bring that with me into the world of OSINT. And so I look at OSINT from a certain point of view. My biggest, biggest thing that I tell people is be curious. 
click on stuff, read stuff, find something that's interesting to you and, and, and dive deep to, into it. There's so many different levels of understanding for the things that we, we do in the world of OSINT, whether you're looking up people, businesses, domains, or just other stuff. There's lots of different areas of OSINT. So, um, my suggestions are one, get some diverse opinions and learn from other people, whether that's uh, using Reddit and the OSINT subreddit, or whether it's using the OSINT Curious uh, Discord or another Discord, get in there and start listening to what other people have to say. Some people are a little hesitant to get in there because they think that they might have to you know, share things or divulge things or it might ruin their privacy. On many of these discords and other groups, you can just sign up for an account with a random name that you choose or the platform chooses, and then you don't have to post anything. So you can just learn from other people. And what's great is that these communities that have, that have popped up all over the world have a diverse set of ideas and methodologies for solving uh, different OSINT challenges. So um, go and meet people. And the other thing um, is um, read, read blog posts, uh, watch videos, go and seek out those things you want to do. Open source intelligence is about open information. And if you use these resources like search engines to just Google or Bing or DuckDuckGo or Yandex, whatever it is that you want to learn in the world of OSINT, you're going to find so many blog posts and YouTube videos and other places that have the things you want to learn. 